Yeah, if it's abuse or sort of general commentary or whatever, we'll take it all. So keep it coming our way between now and uh, just after 9 o'clock or thereabouts. But it is uh, time to let you know what's happening in the newspapers. And I mentioned uh, Ryder Cup pretty much uh, dominating, certainly a lot of the broadsheets this morning. The Irish Examiner here, New Order, Rose and Ram lead from the front as Bjorn mixes it up. Uh, I mean, it does strike me that a lot of the coverage of the Ryder Cup gets old pretty quickly, given that uh, it's underway around about an hour or thereabouts already. But a shot from yesterday's delightful opening ceremony at the Golf Nacional. <laughs> yeah, delightful. Oh. Uh, I think it's probably... I, I didn't actually see it, but just looking at some of the newspaper reports this morning, uh, there is plenty of room to sneer at that opening ceremony yesterday. There was a lot to sneer about. It was... It, they did tend to be cringeworthy. I was at the 2006 uh, Ryder Cup um, here, obviously, and... Um, I mean, I kind of thought it was jaun jaunty and lovely and quite Irish and all that sort of stuff, but I could easily see how um, an audience watching in from abroad would have been would have thought it was twee and cringeworthy. Mm. They do tend to be. Uh, it was pretty awful. Was last night's particularly French? Uh, I didn't watch a lot of it now, but I did see they had a French singer came out, and she seemed pretty good. Like she seemed like a good French. And Kaiser Chiefs, of course, Kaiser very French. Yeah, they. But she was walking up and down the stage with all these like golfers sitting behind her who were not exactly into it, and it just all jarred a bit. But look at you got to get through it, that's what it's all about. So that's the front page of the Examiner uh, this morning. And reflections as well on David Fitzgerald, model behaviour, how Davy Fitz rediscovered his love of hurling in Wexford. Uh, and a lot of stories across some of those pages this morning about uh, Davy Fitz particularly, and how the vast majority of the Wexford uh, team, at some point over the last couple of months, Davy's been sort of wavering about whether he would continue in the Wexford job or not. And they hopped in a bunch of cars en masse, drove down to his home down in Clare and said, listen, here's our commitment. We want you to sort of row back in. And he was obviously won over by it. Um, it's a four-hour trip each way, I think, was, the, was what they were saying. Um, and, like, you know, some of the players leech in, talking about what a pain in the ass it is for them to have one-off trip to, uh, to down to Clare. He's obviously doing, doing it a couple of times a week. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think everybody turned up in your door and going, hey, boss, listen, uh, we like you. Come on back in. It's yeah, it's so win you over. It's, uh, <clears throat> you'd wonder as well how much what happened at the end of the season has changed Davy Fitz's mind as well. Seeing a team like Limerick going on to win the All-Irelands and given that Wexford have maybe not the depth that ha had come through from Limerick at an underage level, but certainly excellent, excellent mm. top-class underage teams coming through, particularly from under-21 level uh, this decade. So he looks at what they're doing. It's not like that great Tipperary team going on to dominate. That hasn't happened. It's not like the great Galway team, if you can call them a great Galway team, doing back-to-back -back and potentially starting an, an era of dominance, or even the Kilkenny Renaissance, which we might fear is just around the corner. That hasn't started yet. So there is Absolutely. like a realistic possibility that David Fitzgerald can mould an All-Ireland winning team out of this, this Wexford crop in the next two seasons. Yeah. So I think he's just been empowered by what he saw from John Kiley's men th this summer, that there is, there is belief for everybody. It's going to be such an amazing hurling championship again next year. It's just uh, it's just what do we do before then to actually whet the appetite. Uh, well, wa 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 watch the Ryder Cup on. It's kind of well, key to that. They, uh, he'll probably manage for like I can't see him out of management, Davy Fitz, for too long. Like health permitting, I, he'll manage for another twenty years, I'm sure, before he sort of sidles off down the punditry route. Yeah, the thing is, like, we, we, it's something that's often mentioned, but it's worth mentioning again is the, like this straight transition that Davy Fitz had from his playing days to his intercounty setup days. Though so it's thirty years involved with top level hurling, which. Mm. It, to a lot of people, is just too much in the pressure cooker. But for Davy Fitz, yeah. I, I suspect it's not enough. Well, it's probably a bit different now. Like he doesn't need to be out the side of the road, sort of poking the ball off the wall anymore, kind of putting the fear of God into his opposition uh, rival goalkeeper, like he used to do. Like, yeah, it's true. A slightly different dynamic now. You know, you don't need to be up at half five, <laughs> poking the ball off the. Uh, off I need the to wall. be up at half five to drive to Wexford. Well, that's very true. Uh, Irish Times this morning. It is uh, Ryder Cup here as well. A bit of a bit of joshing going on there between. Uh, Owen's favourite player, Justin Thomas, and uh, Tiger Woods, who, to be fair to him, is tending a little bit on top. But uh, Justin's there to the rescue to give him a little bit of a, a little bit of grass for the noggin. Uh, time for Tiger heroes Woods in Paris is in trouble. I think no, he's not. He's on the middle. No, of the he's camera. absolutely fine. He's, uh, he's he's <laughs> they, they, the cameras just zoomed in on the water. I was like, no he's way, is this going to be 2006 all over again? And then it just stopped zooming in, and uh, it, and we could see the ball in its perfect place in position A. So yeah. Tommy Fleetwood is uh, <coughs> about to address his ball there now as well. Let me let you know on that in just a second. But yeah, the Irish Times, time for heroes in Paris, uh, writes Philip Reid, who's over at Le Golf National uh, this week. The fun is over, 
and it's time for the golf to start, but it's hard to call which team will emerge victorious. I presume the fun is kind of just beginning. It does strike me that with a lot of these papers without getting too sort of geeky about it, that um, like they've got all the tee times, obviously, for the opening day, four balls and all that sort of stuff. They're a big feature in the front pages. Uh, like, it's all kind of dead stuff, really, by the time. I don't know what the mean time for people buying their newspaper or consuming their newspaper is. I would say between seven and nine. Yeah. On the way to work, no? Well, I'm saying that after 7.55, all this section down here at the right-hand side is sort of done and dusted. Some good shots uh, and reflections as well on that fantastic opening ceremony um, at the Golf National yesterday. The, uh, whatever the equivalent of the Red Arrows is, flying over there with the trickler, uh, red, white and blue, uh, flying over the opening ceremony. David Ginola was the um, unusual choice of host. Uh, yesterday did a pretty good job, I have to say. Oh, I thought he was pretty slick. He yeah. knew his lines, knew his cues, had a bit of personality about him. Could get the. You needed somebody French there. Obviously, this was the other thing. I mean, there isn't much other. There isn't going to be much other French influence over the course of the week. So no, I see on in Malachi Clerken's headline there. He does say that the person who was like doing the warm up for. Uh, David Ginnell uh, encouraged the crowd to make a lot of clap. Mm. Which, uh, is, is, I mean, I just think that's cheap. That you know, I, I laughed. Somebody's somebody's expense on that. You know, English is not their first language. How good is your French? If I, well, if I said in French, let's please make a lot of clap, oh, cool and clap. they laughed at me, I'd be happy enough saying, you know what, I'm uh, I'm, I'm fine being the punching bag. Oh, cool the clap. Exactly. There's yeah. been a lot of French lessons on OTBM this week, as it turns out. I've learned a lot. Yeah. Uh, the Irish Independent this morning, McElroy ready to roar is the headline here with his rookie sidekick, Olison, uh, as the two guys give each other a fist bump there. Um, yeah, so they are out on the way in the last little while as well. And Spieth and, and Thomas have uh, taken the first hole there in their matchup. So Casey and Hatton, you'd, I definitely assume that was a bit of a uh, right off. Right off that. Matchup, I have to admit. Uh, but yeah, an interesting pairing there between Torby Arn Olsen and uh, Rory McIlroy, the uh, the rookie, obviously, and McIlroy, who is now a bit of a, I mean, a bit of a veteran almost of these things at this stage, and a, a veteran golfer. But Olsen is twenty eight, so it's not he's like he's a kid who needs to have his sort of hand held around as he goes. The other interesting story is away from the Ryder Cup that's uh, on the back of the Irish Independent here, right? Uh, Sam Wallace, uh, that Barcelona may not be able to afford Pogba deal in uh, Pogba January deal which is an absolute nightmare for the guy because, uh, like it seems to all intents and purposes, if you read the fairly overt body language of this clip that's been doing the rounds during the week, like neither party is overly happy with it. Um, it might take, I, it looks like the way um, Mourinho's going and there's some more interesting stories that you'll have for us in just a minute that might sort of rubber stamp uh, some of that. Uh, in fact, this one here from the Irish Daily Mail this morning. Uh, Mourinho wrapped young star over his attitude. So this is uh, Jose Mourinho having a go at Marcus Rashford, who failed to do the exact uh, warm down that he should have done uh, at a game recently. And Mourinho's like, oh, this guy's attitude stinks. So there's all these players sort of cracking up, racking up and there's all these little bits of uh, lines that are coming out of these, coming out of United at the minute that you assume are coming from a whole pile of disgruntled player, players and you assume as well that at some point or another that... That is just going to go. That's just going to end up being a split between Mourinho and the club sooner rather than later. It has to be, doesn't it? Because the only other alternative here on the Pogba situation is that he gets word of the idea that he's not going to go to Barcelona. Now, if Juventus were to come up with the cash, mm. I suspect Paul Pogba might like to, to go back there to, to go back and not to to merely kind of rekindle his love for the club if, if that ever existed, but to play alongside Cristiano Ronaldo mm -hmm. at which point then they might be able to next season put together a, a real case for winning the Champions League granted Cristiano Ronaldo will be another year older but if Barcelona can't stop up the cash if Juventus isn't a live option this January then Paul Pogba's got no option but to kiss and make up with Jose Mourinho yeah. like he's done enough to undermine his uh, managerial kind of status over the last seven days and when I say done enough I, I think it's just that attack 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 press conference which I really didn't like I don't think a lot of people really did like that kind of undermining of of Jose's management that if you can do it that quickly on that scale is there a potential for him to make up as quickly on the other side of things well mm. the one big barrier to that is Jose Mourinho's capacity to forgive well that's the interesting part right uh, he's supposed to be the adult in this conversation you know like I mean that in like the sort of business sense of things. He's supposed to be the one who's able to step into it and go, right, look at what's the problem here? The problem is I'm rapidly getting a whole bunch of disillusioned players. How do I solve that? Well, maybe I'll sit down and have a conversation with them and say, look at what's wrong, what do you need from me, what can we do a bit better? Like, it's not as if we're having a conversation with a guy here, which is a slight difference in maybe in Rashford's case, with a guy who's not going to be in the team. Like, he starts every week. That's just the plain and simple of it. It's not... 
a player who's disgrunt- disgruntled about not getting a game. So in that context, you know, sit down and figure it out. Like, why does it need to be all this sort of public over and back? Yeah, well, it clearly shouldn't be this public over and back. And I will say that when it came to the public sort of storm this season between Pogba and Jose Mourinho, Paul Pogba started it. And I know that's quite a childish thing to say. Well, you started it and yeah. I'm going I'm to come back at you and uh, br- bring all my wrath in your direction. Yeah. But I think that there is enough to be said to defend Paul Pogba in terms of privately what has been said between Jose Mourinho and Pogba. The unhappiness with Pogba as a public figure, as an Instagram figure, yeah. as a millennial, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, that sort of stuff I don't really like. I think Jose Mourinho needs to adapt to modern human beings a little bit better. But ultimately, when it came to this thing being played out in the public, Paul Pogba uh, rolled the dice first. It wasn't Jose Mourinho. And that either can, can lead to Paul Pogba coming forward and saying, look, I'm sorry, I, I, see, I see I've done wrong. Or it's, it's just going to strengthen Jose Mourinho's hand. He's a very stubborn man. Mm. And once he's got a strong hand, you'd imagine Paul Pogba's career is going to be in a, in a tough place at Manchester United. Yeah. Ah, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I just think all is said and done that regardless of how it came about or who threw the first punch, somebody's got to step in and go, this isn't working out. It's not... Uh, this is not what. What's going to step in? What's, it's got to be Mourinho. Like it's got to be. It's got to come from him. Uh, like what's the best thing for Man United? But if there, who's if there asking are, that question? Yeah, well, if, if there are such loggerheads, somebody stepping in can't be Jose Mourinho. Like does Ed Woodward get involved in this? I can't but, see that but, happening. So, so my point is, if it isn't Mourinho, he's got Mourinho's got to leave. Well, that's the thing. Or the other part, the, the key component in all of this that is definitely going to step in is Mino Raiola, mm. uh, and I can assure you that he is already having his word with Paul Pogba. And the thing is, like we said it before on the show, that I, I really do think that Raiola wants to get one more move for Paul Pogba mm. before agents' fees are completely clamped down upon and perhaps next mm. summer with a new FIFA directive. So I think it's in his interest to get Paul Pogba out of the club. He wants Paul Pogba to be winning matches. Ultimately, the whole celebrity can only last so long if you're mm. playing poorly. Sure. Or potentially, does this get to a stage where Paul Pogba's not playing at all? Uh, well, I mean, I don't know. I, I, my view is, I think that, and I wasn't of this opinion a few weeks ago, that uh, it just seems that the constant trickle of disgruntled players, my view is that it's going to end in Mourinho leaving sooner rather than later. Yeah, it is. I can't see any other outcome. There, there is a, a growing list at, um, at this point. Digger Forum has been in touch. He says, don't take the bait, on." I mean, I don't know what I've been baiting you about. Yeah, you haven't so. baited me about anything. This. It's yet, already like know. five past eight and you haven't said anything to anger me yet, which is a good start to my Friday morning. So uh, feeling happier than usual this Friday morning. Uh, let's take you through some of the rest of the papers. The Herald leads with Thorne in his side, or in the US side, sorry. World number two rose partners, John Ram, <laughs> to take on Kepka Early on, fine. in the opening four balls at the Ryder Cup. Uh, back page of the Mirror this morning is the greatest show on turf. Bjorn backs Europe stars to become legends and put Tiger out to grass. And uh, new way Barca refused to meet £200 million valuation for unhappy Paul Pogba. Now the back page of the Irish Daily Star this morning also goes with the golf and with the Paul Pogba story. A Pogs dinner, says the football element, in slams feuding Reds ace. So Paul Pogba has made Manchester United a joke and will be sold in January, according to Paul Ince. He believes that the club are now a laughing stock and something like this would never have happened under Sir Alex Ferguson. Of course, uh, it never would have come to, to blow us under Alex Ferguson because he just simply got rid of him. And uh, in the golf, it's Europe holding on Ooh, for a hair. Patrick Reid is in the water on the first. Uh, yes, get in there. Oh, the Ryder Europe. Cup has landed. It oh, certainly my has. Word. Francesco um, Molinari had just hit a sweet approach shot uh, on the first against Reid and Woods, and then Reid follows it up by landing in the drink. And how's Tiger doing on that hole? I haven't seen you, keep, you keep an eye on Tiger while I go through the rest of the back pages. Uh, the sun <laughs> goes with shock and more. Uh, Jose's uh, Jones and Bailly quip upset stars. So this is the other elements. Uh, him kind of giving out about Phil Jones and Eric Bailly being the last two penalty takers. He knew he was going to be in trouble, despite the fact that you know Richard Keogh was on penalties for Derby County at that point as well. I think uh, if uh, if their centre back is stepping up, you can't really give out too much about your own centre backs having to step up to take a penalty. The rest of the dressing room is ups- upset by this comment. Uh, you've also got uh, rookie four. Bjorn punt on new boys. Uh, that's of course uh, Roy McIlroy there in the back in his fourth Ryder Cup. And then just a couple of more back pages for you this morning. The Racing Post goes with rise and shine. Ryder Cup rivals hard to split in early exchanges, and that has proved to be the case at the moment so far. I think Europe are one up and one. USA are one up and one. Yeah, it looks it's all yeah, square in the other. The scoreboard there in the last couple of minutes. Your boy Hatton has just uh, not run as close as he should have done. 
right, maybe he's crumbling under the pressure, maybe. Uh, back page of the Guardian then is that battle commence. Bjorn Sight's opportunity to follow Europe's greats. Yeah, so that's sort of where we're at. Um, the Ryder Cup is ongoing. Uh, Justin Spieth uh, has a putt here to have the whole... Is that what you're calling their duo, Justin Spieth? Justin Spieth, that's exactly a slip of the tongue there. But um, so, Justin Spieth... Uh, has Jordan Thomas that. has got a better ring. Uh, <laughs> yeah, see, I mean, you get everywhere on is the short story. Yes, uh, two Kerry jerseys at the Ryder Cup, side by side. They usually pop up in fits and bursts at the Masters, obviously. Just, just a quick one while it's on the screen there. So Europe are uh, one up in the top match, Rose and Ram against Kepka and Fina. It's all square between McElroy and Olsen and Johnson and Fowler. Uh, Spieth and Thomas are one up in Casey and Hatton. And Molinari and Fleetwood up against Reed and Woods are currently on the uh, first green. So that's the current state of play. Uh, well, yeah, you boys get it. Is, is it more, I wonder, is it worse than, um, I wonder, is that worse than the sort of, you know, uh, mashed potato brigade. What? Uh, okay, <laughs> this is inc- like we, it's like somebody just tweeted in and was like, "Oh, Owen's not taking the bait," and you're like, "Let me just think no, of something no, no. absolutely Actually, ridiculous no. to say." How is that in well, any way so comparable to the mashed potato? And, it's so cliche, <laughs> and, cliche. and like expected, the, and like it's. You're, oh, we're going to the Ryder Cup. Let's get on. Let's get our Kerry jerseys on, and like, come on, let's give it a break. <laughs> How, how, does it it it, it, how does it in any way compare to the chauvinistic nature of shouting mashed potatoes? Just, like, it's just as infuriating is the point. Like, it's, is it? That gets yeah, you angry. Just, like, that gets you angry. I, look, I can't say it gets me angry, but I am a bit... Well, you fat- said it's I'm infuriating. A bit, I'm a bit fatigued by it. Let me, let me change my description there. I'm what about mashed potato? How does that make you feel? I, that's, I'm probably I'm in the same sort of territory. I'm like, it's needless. Both are fairly needless. You're sickening. That's an. That's an, uh, That's probably your worst. Take and also, do, are they, do they bring sort of three Kerry jerseys each? Why? Because or they just wear the same Kerry jersey all week? Right? Are you saying it's the same people? It's a strong golfing county. There's well, that's almost makes it worse. What? That makes it worse. I mean, I'm not. I'm not for a second suggesting that the mashed potato guy is the same guy at every tournament. So I'm assuming there's also different Kerry fans who. Um, who do this thing. I just think like... If I was at the Ryder Cup, I'd be wearing my Kerry jersey. Oh, would you really? Yeah, 100%. No, you wouldn't. Yes, I would. There's nothing wrong with it. Yeah, sure, I'd be, fami- I'd be famous on the internet right now if I, uh, if I was wearing my <laughs> We'd be jersey. discussing what an asshole you are right here, right now. That's, well, that's... you know, it's, uh, as long as people are talking about me, it doesn't matter if they're calling me an asshole, basically. <laughs> uh, so that's, that is the uh, very, very latest with the Ryder Cup. We've lots of that coming your way uh, over the course of this morning. And we're going to, uh, a little bit later on, catch up with uh, Alan Quinlan as well. He's going to talk all things rugby for us uh, a little later in the day. Um, but there was a tweet that jumped out at me a little bit. It's 10 past 8, by the way, on this Friday morning. We are delighted to have you with us, and we do want to hear from you as well. So keep your comments coming in, whether it's on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. Uh, whatever you're having yourself, do get uh, in touch with us.